Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh. I am the, uh, the music leader here at, at Beggar's Table. Uh, it's great to be with you guys this morning in a sort of in a pseudo with you kind of a way. Um, this is something, something new that we're doing this week, and we're very excited about it. It's, uh, it's just a, another way that we get to engage uh, with everybody and kind of maintain our community uh, and to continue to, to um, just, just engage in the habits and the practices that, that we like to do that, that shape us and inform us and help make us uh, kind of the church that we want to be here at Beggar's Table. Uh, so we're going to continue um, to do those things, singing and, and praying and, and studying together. And as we continue this morning, I'm going to lead us in a couple of prayers. Uh, this is our, our prayer of acclamation. I'll, I'll say this first line and then invite you to join in with me. So let's all pray together today. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. And would you please, uh, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, join uh, with me and with everybody this morning, your hearts and your minds and your voices in prayer. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let's uh, continue our time together this morning uh, as we sing another song to the Lord. Oh 
Good morning. My name is John Bowles, and I'm the pastor of Beggar's Table Church. So it's really good to have you with us this morning. I want to say welcome to all of our Beggar's Table Church members. And I also want to say welcome to any guests who might be invited or um, joining us from the comfort of your home. We're glad to have you with us. Um, Really quickly, I want to give a couple of announcements of some things that are going on right now. Uh, July 12th, we will be having our pop-up market in the parking lot outside of our building. So we are partnering with Roots for Refugees, and there's a refugee farmer who will be selling his produce beginning at 10 o'clock in the morning in the gravel parking lot across the street from us in our building here. Um, and uh, we encourage everyone to come down and buy your produce for the week from this refugee farmer. We're really excited to be able to partner with this important mission work in Kansas City. So that's July 12th, Sunday, July 12th. That's what we'll be doing, as well as posting our normal teaching series online. Don't forget, July 25th is a Saturday, and we have another outdoor movie at Dave Tucker's house that night. We just had uh, our first summer outdoor movie last night, and it was a blast. We all had such a good time, so we can't wait to do it again. And that's going to be Saturday, July 12th, 25th. The movie that we'll be showing is pending, so stay tuned to find out what movie we'll be showing. Right now, I just want to guide us into our teaching series that we're in the middle of. We're in the middle of this Sunday morning teaching series that we're calling Words to Build a Life on. They're words to build a life on because we're riffing on what Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7 when he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who builds his house on a rock. And right now is an incredible moment in history for us to have some wise words to know how to construct our lives and to build our lives. And so we're listening to the words of Jesus We've been talking about the Beatitudes for a lot of weeks, and the Beatitudes are just so timely, especially with everything that's going on in our country, let alone in our world right now. The Beatitudes have been such a timely conversation, so I'm extra excited to invite you to enjoy this next conversation, which is on the next Beatitude in our series, Blessed Are the Peacemakers. Peacemaking is something that we need to do, it's something that we need to hear about, and it's something that we need to... Uh, engage in a really meaningful way. So we'll be talking about Jesus' words, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. So please sit back and enjoy the conversation that I have with my friend and fellow pastor, Rustin Smith, pastor of Vox Day Community each week. Enjoy. Welcome, Rustin. I'm welcoming you to your church, even though I'm the visitor this week. But... um, 
It's good to be with you, yeah. and I enjoy our conversations. These are uh, really fun for me, and hopefully for you guys too. Mm-hmm. We, uh, our idea, of course, was that um, there are op- opportunities that are embedded in the setbacks of the virus, and one of those opportunities is that we're not bound by time and space anymore, and we can be together, and yeah. we can create a conversation instead of just talking by ourselves into a camera. And, and so I think that this is engaging, and I've gotten good feedback from it. So thanks for, for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for coming out here, out to Belton. And, out to Belton. Uh, and being here at the Vox Cafe again this week. Well, and, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah. Um, this we're, is, by the way, this has worked well, but it also is, is um, uh, some things are getting easier as we go. Mm-hmm. Some things I'm just getting so tired of, and I can't mm-hmm. wait to get back to seeing people and being with people physically. And uh, I was just... Pondering that because it seems like our journey through the Beatitudes as far has, has followed a similar tra- trajectory. Like there's a sense in which the intensity of these things are increasing or the challenge of them. And that kind of mirrors the intensity with which our culture is driving deeper into division and it's really true, <laughs> and, and crisis. It? Yeah. And so when we started out in this, I thought, well, we're we're going to be in a time of disruption. It would be good to find the solid ground of the kingdom with Jesus language and go to the Beatitudes. But more and more, I find myself going, man, I really need some orientation from Jesus. And and his words are continuing to challenge and orient and and kind of line me up in a a place that's honestly uh, pointed in a lot of different directions than uh, the available uh, views. (laughs) <laughs> I should say, I'm trying to be gentle. The available views. <laughs> you know, yeah. from one side or another on any given yeah. issue. Um, so yeah, I agree. Anyway, it's been really good for me, and I hope for everybody else that's, yeah. that's joining us. I mean, the disruption that we have been feeling, it was not anything that we would have predicted when we began no. the Beatitudes, but it's been such a blessing to be talking about these now yeah. and in this time. And, yeah. and they continue to be really timely. The Beatitude for today is from Matthew 5, I believe it's verse 9. That says, blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And of course, before we get into it, we, we just want to establish right off that the coming of God's kingdom and the Messiah has always been associated with the coming of peace. Mm-hmm. Um, so peace goes hand in hand with everything that our faith is about. Yeah. For example, we go to Isaiah 9, and as Isaiah looks forward to the Messiah, he writes... For to us a child is born, a son is given. This is very famous. Mm -hmm. Um, And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And then the last title is Prince of Peace. Yeah. Prince of Peace. Um, Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Mm. I always like that sentence. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will Mm -hmm. be no end. He will reign on David's throne. And over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. So, yeah. so I I love that language, and it's but it strikes me as really odd hearing that language here. What are we in the middle of June? Mm-hmm. Uh, because that's a that's a Christmas reading. Yeah, and and I just realized that I so associate the the that enduring government of peace with that little baby line in the manger. Yeah, right. And it, But is that a way that, that maybe we dismiss what's really going on there to, yeah. by associating that with baby Jesus? And then, oh, but he'll, he'll grow up and get around to, yeah. you know, that lends us, some muscle. That lends itself to our conversation. Okay. But let's let's not allow seasons like Christmas to co-op all the, those verses yeah. to, 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 to take well, the meaning I, away from what I is so that. important for our lives. Okay. But um, so so yeah, Rustin, we're, we're going to get into that because what I, the first thought I had is, man, this is a timely conversation because if there's anything that we need is peace. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, you know what though, a lot of people in our nation would disagree with me, and they would they would actually say this is not timely because what we need now is justice. Yeah. Now you and I know, and hopefully everybody that's been following us know that in the Beatitudes, justice is also spoken about. We already talked about the Beatitude that. Yeah. Talks about hungering and thirsting for justice, and yeah. um, but 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 it's like well, what we what we need is justice, not peace, because peace insinuates yeah. laying down our arms, and it insinuates what you just said: a baby in a manger, yeah, and and just just well, softness, and and the two the 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 call for it can seem disingenuous. Like mm-hmm. if you have a, if you have a, a 
a point of justice that's that's valid of something that requires something of me but i just say well let's just be at peace mm-hmm. well i'm just dismissing the fact that an injustice is is going on you know i kind of want to skip past the hard stuff and let's just get along right right insinuate skipping and yeah so so the call for peace can be a deflection uh, or or it can be heard as a deflection to those who are su- still suffering injustice yeah exactly yeah. So that's well danger. said okay and, you know, we're living in a time now where we are being exposed as being wrong for remaining silent. Mm-hmm. Um, so silence is violence, right? And, um, <laughs> right? and and so, again, a lot of times when you hear this is the time for peace and we need peacemakers, what we hear is we need a lot of silence and, and just laying down and being quiet. Yeah. Again, like so many of these Beatitudes, there's a misunderstanding here. I feel like almost every week we start off by saying, well, what do you think of when you hear purity? What do you think of when you hear... We're misunderstanding what's being said a lot of times. I think that's what these Beatitudes have helped me. One of the many things they've helped me with is leading me into this posture, this season of humility, which we all just need desperately. And I Mm -hmm. talked about it this last Sunday with uh, Vox folks that... Uh, almost everything we know is wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a good place just to start in humility and go, I need to ask, I need to challenge all my own assumptions. I need to ask next questions. I need to listen mm-hmm. and learn. And especially, I, I hope, you know, listen and learn from Jesus. Totally. Yeah. So let me ask you, Rustin. I'm going to pose a question for you. It's a okay. scenario. <laughs> let's say, I know this never happens, but let's say you're in a, a situation that has conflict. Okay. <laughs> We That's, don't have conflict at Vox Day, I know, no, but um, no. but 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 to make it more, pre- you know, one of a useful metaphor for me is to think of the family because families always have conflict. Yeah. Whenever you're, it doesn't matter how loving you are as a family, you're going to have conflict. So oh, only if you see each other. Only yeah. if you see each other, and most <laughs> families are are there's so much dysfunction in them anyway. Yeah. So let's just say you're not in the, not ours, but <laughs> so hypothetically you're in a family with dysfunction, <laughs> okay. and, and which means there's conflict. And I don't know what that conflict would be. Use your imagination. It could mm-hmm. involve your wife, could involve your kids, whatever. Your it's parents, not, yeah. all that kind of thing. That's not hard. Okay. I'm with you. You're with me. <laughs> I, I simply want to ask you, what are the available options that you've kind of been trained in for how to resolve the conflict oh. or what to do? Like, what, what, what do you do typically in yeah. your family, let alone in your church? Well, what do you do to resolve the conflict? What, what are the ways that come, come to mind, or at least the first things that we think of, mm-hmm. that would actually bring peace? Oh, what, to I mean, bring peace. <laughs> what, what, well, I mean, what we typically think of as bringing peace. I regret I, that the first thing to, that came to my mm-hmm. mind was to bring more chaos and, <laughs> yeah. and fight. Uh, well, that might um, be a legitimate option. Yeah. Well, no, honestly, though, what came to mind, I mean, that was honest, too. Mm-hmm. Hopefully everything I'm saying is honest. Yeah. But not too honest. <laughs> um, That's the fine what, line we walk as a pastor, by the way. <laughs> I want to be honest, but not too honest. That's my guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said it was Eugene Peterson or somebody talked about leadership is disappointing at people at a rate that they can stand. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if we can do that today. Um I just went through this with uh, one of my sons this week Mm -hmm. when we were in a disagreement about something he wanted and something I wanted. And my my first uh, response or my instinct was, okay, I'm going to lay down the law here. This Mm. is, I'm not, I'm not an angry person. I got Mm -hmm. other problems. I'm not typically angry though. Um, But my, my instinct, because I wanted it resolved quickly, I was like, okay, here's how this is going to go. And it's going to involve... You giving me your technology and you're done. And if you don't do what I say, so I, I, so that was a, a way to resolve the conflict and get us back to some sort of workable arrangement was yeah. to take over. Yeah. Is that something you're looking for? Well, I mean, that's one option, right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's a, maybe the first option we could talk about is, is, you know how I resolve peace? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know how, I mean, resolve peace, you know how we get peace and resolve mm-hmm. conflict. Mm-hmm. And, the, and one way that we've been trained to do that is by fighting in, yeah. in, in fighting back, but, but not just fighting by winning. So by you winning. gave an example as a parent, it's easy to win when you're the parent because you, you say, yes, you yeah. know, this is how it's going to be. These are our rules. Yeah. But that is legitimately, I think maybe the dominant way that we have been shown to enforce yeah. peace is through enforcing it which brings about a kind of conformity. You really didn't get resolution with your son, yeah. but you got him to conform to what you yeah. wanted. Yeah. Actually, I, I caught myself in real time this week because I'm growing up. Okay, learning. yeah. 
And, and, and we both stopped and we went a completely different direction. And maybe we'll get around to that now that I'm thinking about it. Okay. But I realized that first way is not, the, it's not who I want to be. I don't think it's who Jesus is. And, uh, yeah, right. but we're leaving Jesus out of it for the moment. <laughs> uh, because, because what we have to do, I think, is give attention to the, the uh, culture that Jesus was a part of. Mm. Um, because a lot of people don't realize that Rome cared a lot about peace. In fact, their mantra was Pax Romana, which is... The peace of Rome. The peace of Rome. They're, they saw their mission as bringing peace to the mm-hmm. world. The way that they brought peace to the world was through being powerful yeah. and and making everyone become Roman, making everyone conform to a certain standard. Yeah. And and you understand the logic of that is that if, yeah. if everyone just gives oh. in to our way, there will be peace. That's which I kind of think is the mentality of any superpower. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that was that was I mean Caesar's Caesar was largely associated with peace. On, on, uh-huh. on a Roman coin in those days, you would find an inscription that would say, you know, Caesar Augustus, and then it would say the bringer of peace. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that was the idea. That's why, I mean, Caesar was thought of as a god. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons is because they brought peace through this mass conformity, which is really just another way of saying might makes right. We win. Mm-hmm. So we can point our finger to Rome, but I also think, as you know, that this is... This is still the case today. This is largely yeah. the American way. Is that fair to say that might makes right and we bring peace yeah. through conformity? Yeah. It's one of the... <laughs> I, did I just say I mean, something bad? Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Um, it's, it's... I mean, we're just talking to each other. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the elements of the, the classic rhetoric of any empire is we will bring peace. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. will, if you will devote yourself to us and give us your allegiance, we will make this peaceful so that you can have a, a stable and peaceful life. Yeah, yeah. And and but I can't help but keep applying that back though to uh, as a boss, as a parent. My my const- my imagination uh, has been formed in such a way that I'm constantly tempted to short circuit any sort of relationality or self emptying Jesus way and force my way. To, mm-hmm. sh- to get to a livable, peaceable yeah. situation. Well, I mean, it's understandable that you mm-hmm. do that. I yeah. think that it's the water we swim in. Yeah. I think that it's it's how we have been mm-hmm. trained. And I'll just say this. I won't go off on the tangent, but I'll just say between you and me, it's the way of the American church as well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we, we've kind of been trained. It's just mm-hmm. dog eat dog. Yeah. And the last... The guy who eats the last dog gets his picture on a magazine, you know? I mean, that's that's what it comes down to, right? Uh, uh, so uh, I've never heard that. That's, yeah, you like that. Well, I've, it's an awkward laugh. Okay, so that's tough. Yeah. the first way that we mm-hmm. would normally think of resolving yeah. conflict and, and, and getting to peace would be the yeah. way... We could say the way of Rome. That's yeah. safe now. You could, but the way of Rome well, of, of conformity, winning. Yeah. yeah. Any other thing come to mind about how? Well, you I think achieve? of my own personality that I'm a person who values being at peace. But the, what I have discovered is I can do violence in another direction by withdrawing, uh, by avoiding. Um, yeah, the passive but, aggressive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I think that's another legitimate option, Rustin. You just ticked mm-hmm. off the first two things okay. that I listed. Man, I'm on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I agree with you. I think, in, in, the, in other words, we achieve quote-unquote peace and we resolve conflict by we, we experience tension mm-hmm. and then we just flee. Mm-hmm. We ignore. Okay. That would be probably more about what people are criticizing the white community for today is yeah. just white flight white and flight, ignoring yeah. and remaining silent. But we just, get, we, we just remove ourselves from it. Yeah. And you're right. It's really violent. I mean, I, I know that... Um, when I feel a tension in my family, we start off talking about families, like with my kids, for example. And if they just if they just turn away and walk away from me, it, it always feels so wrong. Like, mm-hmm. don't do that. You can't yeah. do that. It feels almost violent. Like, yeah. I, I need I need you to be here with me. Yeah. But we, I think that we've been trained not just to win, but we've also been trained in this other way, and of just if people are hurting you, ignore them. You know yeah. and. There's wisdom in that, but at the same time, right? Yeah, but withdrawal and distancing yourself. I think this has just been a hard lesson of my life. That withdrawal mm. can be uh, as painful to the other person as attack. 
It can be. Yeah. And, and you and I know that well yeah. because our vocation is one in which people constantly walk away from us or leave the church. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and it leaves us sometimes going, man, I wish they would have told me what they didn't like or, or yeah. what was wrong. And, right. You know, Rustin, I, I, I won't elaborate too much, but I, I just had a, a situation with someone in my church who had been there for a few years. And we, and, and you know what, you won't believe this, but the conflict arose. Um, <laughs> and the situation arose. And, and to be more specific, he was instigating a conversation with me where I could tell that if I said what I wanted to say, it was going to create conflict. Okay. And it's funny because in my head, at the same time that I was processing through this, I knew that sadly, that the moment I created the conflict, that was probably his ticket to leave the church, you mm -hmm. know, that he wouldn't yeah. stay with me. And of course, that's what happened is that he, he was like, oh, you created mm -hmm. conflict. I'm going to leave the church. Deep down inside, I so desire to see people go, oh, OK, let's navigate through this conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, let's let's come to real reconciliation and real peace. Mm. I know that hardly ever happens. Yeah. I knew exactly I what know. would I happen. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm telling you foreign stories. <laughs> but uh, I, I knew exactly what would happen is how it played out. But I also knew what my desire was like. Oh, it's yeah. so bad that we, because we have not been trained in what I would call a third way of oh. achieving peace. Well, it sounds like uh, the word that came to mind when you said working through that conflict mm -hmm. is the word that Jesus uses here. M making peace. Making peace. Making peace. And suddenly, the I said it that way on purpose because mm -hmm. peacemaking suddenly becomes an emphasis on the making. The making of peace. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the keeping of peace mm -hmm. or just the living in peace, but it's making peace. Yeah. So I think we've got on one hand we've got fighting the yeah. way of Rome, the way yeah. of the way of government, yeah. the way of superpowers. We have the way of avoidance, mm -hmm. which is the way probably for the rest of us that aren't super powerful. <laughs> yeah. uh, the the way of fleeing, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then but I, I don't think in either of those make peace. I don't think. Yeah, they, I can see how even as you're talking that those are ways you might. You might argue that they keep peace, although mm -hmm. then we might have to wrangle about what, what, peace, what is. peace is. Yeah. But at least it keeps conflict away. Yeah. Uh, one of them but makes, they're not making anything. Yeah, one of them makes conformity. And, and, and mm -hmm. one of them makes, uh, what is the other? The, the other one just makes uh, the opposite of community. <laughs> isolation. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. It makes isolation. Which was the, the mm -hmm. kind of thing in my heart about parenting this week is I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want conformity. Uh, and I don't, I don't want distance. What I want is real interactive relationship where we come to understand and we walk together through. Yeah. Uh, and where we have differences, that we sort those out and listen to one another. And so yeah. I feel like it. There's a third way mm -hmm. of making of making peace mm -hmm. that Jesus is addressing here. Okay. And what we need to do is lean into that. What is that? I mean, after all, we have to remember that Jesus himself says in John 14, 27, he says, mm. I leave you a new way to peace. Yeah. I leave you. I mean, he, he addresses it directly. He yeah. says, I leave you. He might as well have said a third way yeah. for peace. He says, I am giving you my peace, but not in the way that the world gives peace. So yeah. he's. I think he's addressing exactly what people felt them mm. from Rome and from one another. He says, neither of these, either winning and fleeing, don't bring peace. Mm. Here is what brings peace. And this is the third way. Oh, and, and now oh, it, that's good. And now it becomes our job as pastors to make mm. known what this third way is. And that's where it gets tricky because, quite yeah. frankly, I, I'm all muddled about it. I mean, yeah. I think I have some answers, but it's, it's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready for your answers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... You know, I, in, in, I might let you elaborate on this as well. I, I always think that the cross, um, mm. that's the first thing that comes to mind when I think about making peace. Cause, oh, here we go. Yeah, I know, because when we look at the cross, we have the whole, so you've got the conflict, and then you've got the resolution of yeah. the conflict, but it's not through winning or fleeing. It's, it's an incredible presence, yeah. um, but it's not a presence that's acting out in violence. Uh, it's a presence that allows itself to suffer, a suffering presence, if you will, mm -hmm. that um, is eventually vindicated through resurrection. But mm. that, that, I'll yeah. throw those big concepts out yeah. there for you to... Well, it's super challenging, and mm -hmm. I, I run across this all the time. I mean, I live in, out here in, in Cass County. I grew up in an even smaller, uh, more rural, more red place, so uh, 
you know, my brother was a, a police officer, uh, come from military family. Uh, yeah, I, I hope that like my street cred, whenever we talk about this type of topic is legit, you know, I'm, uh, a lot of that stuff makes sense to me, or it made sense to me in the isolation of growing up in a small town where everybody's the same color. Mm-hmm. Uh, my journey since then has led me in a lot of different places, and um, not just culturally, but theologically. And so something that comes up all the time about violence uh, has to do with uh, how people read Jesus to reinforce their own ideas about self-preservation and self-defense and, and that kind of thing. Now, this is super slippery. And it'll probably make people mad. I always have every time I've talked about it at Vox. So I can't imagine you making but people mad. But oh, you'd, yeah. you'd be surprised. <laughs> but I, I would like to get into that and get your feedback on okay. it. Because there's this one place where people go. And I've seen it recently. Um, I, I saw a meme. It was on, a, on, on Facebook. <laughs> Are we really going to talk about this? Um, Chris Rock said, there's this, there's this new app out that lets you know which of your relatives is racist. It's called Facebook. So um, <laughs> yeah. he said that like you know, 10 uh, years ago. That's funny. Uh, I had not heard that. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just laughing because this is painful stuff. And uh, But there's this meme going around about this time that Jesus, it's in Luke 22, sends his follower, or tells he's given instruction to his disciples, and he says, and I, I made a note of this, so let me read it to you. It's in Luke 22, 35, he said, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Go, like, go get a sword. Uh, and so I, the, that's up there as a scripture. And then the photo that goes with it is like this AR-15 and a sidearm and a pouch of hand grenades. I don't think it's grenades, but it was used as this thing of like, hey, Jesus said it's okay for me to arm myself, so I'm going to do that. And I'd like to address that because I think it's an egregious misreading of Jesus. Now, let me say, I like shooting stuff, and I'm, I'm pretty good at shooting those clay pigeons with a shotgun. I don't do it that often, but I like guns. I grew up around guns, so I'm not like an anti-gun person. But it really bothered me to see Jesus' words used to reinforce this idea that it's okay that we shoot people with our guns. Uh, that aside... Uh, I just wanted to be clear about what I think Jesus was saying in that. So can we talk about that? Yeah, because violence is often well, thought that, of as a way to get peace. It's the and, first way. It's yeah. the peace of Rome. It's, it's the peace of if Rome. If I have more firepower than you, then, I'll, then we'll keep peace here. Yeah. Um, but let me put that in context because there's an episode in Luke where Jesus in Luke 9 sends out his disciples. And if you remember when he sends them out, then he tells them not to take anything with them. Mm-hmm. Like don't, don't take anything. Just go and be, learn how to be dependent on God. Mm-hmm. Well, now we're getting closer to the cross and the, in his arrest. And so Jesus instructs them again. And it's the same kind of language. So I'm sure Luke has this parallel in mind. And Jesus says, now, now, when you go out, like before I told you not to take a purse, but now take a purse and also a bag. Like, take your money, take your stuff. If you don't have a sword, you should get a sword. Uh, but then he goes, it is written, and, it, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I will tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, that what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. So there he quotes Isaiah 53 or something about uh, that he would be numbered among the transgressors. So keep that in mind. So the disciples respond by going, hey, we happen to have two swords with us. And do you remember what Jesus says to them? That's enough. Okay. Two swords is enough. So keep that in mind. So again, that verse is used to for, for like modern American people to go, it's okay for me to own weapons to defend myself. Uh, because Jesus told his disciples to get a to get a sword, but there's some problems with it contextually. First, when they're arrested, Peter uses a sword. Do you remember that? Cuts a guy's ear off. Sure. And Jesus immediately says, "Enough of that. Put your sword away. Yeah. Put it, put it back in the sheath where it belongs." Yeah. The early Christians took that and said, "When Jesus disarmed Peter, he disarmed all Christians." And for the first 300 years of the church, Christians would not participate in anything violent. Mm. That all changed with Constantine and Mm -hmm. the history that we've all been over. The other thing that happens is Jesus is arrested. He appears before Pilate, and 
Pilate is asking him, are you a king? And are you, are you the revolutionary you're accused of being? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. It's not of this world is how we usually translate it. But he means, basically, if I was going to start something, I would have told my guys to get more than two swords. Mm-hmm. You think two swords is going to start a revolution? You think it's even going to be effective against the temple guards or a single Roman soldier yeah. <laughs> who was trained to kill? Um, so... It's a tough case to make from that when you understand how the Bible works and and not just cherry pick one verse. I mean, it's the Isaiah 53 thing that Jesus wants to be numbered among the transgressors, which means the appearance of having a couple of weapons around is going to be sort of a Martin Luther King kind of direct action. He's going to force the hand. It's going to look like a bunch of bandits who are causing trouble because they've got a sword with them. Mm -hmm. But it's clear from what ensues from there that Jesus never intends for them to use those yeah. swords but to do something symbolic yeah so yeah in, we're, in, we're missing the fight scene and there's no fight scene. <laughs> there's no fight and scene. ultimately what jesus does instead is gives himself over to arrest yeah. he willingly goes to the cross willingly gives up his life yeah and as you said the vindication comes in the resurrection mm-hmm. which is a way of god saying we all should listen to jesus and do it the jesus way yeah. Which is maybe the third way you're talking about. Yeah, I think so. so I know that's yeah. super rough, and if nobody's ever heard that before, that could, I mean, that blew my hair back the first time I heard it when I was younger. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it's not a hard and fast rule that, that, uh, um, that you, uh, that immediately leads to political philosophy. It's not what I'm talking about, but just we're talking about what it looks like to keep peace and whether it's legitimate to use violence to keep peace. Yeah. Well, I mean, the story of Jesus in uh, the gospel, mm-hmm. and the formation of, of his people and his kingdom, I mean, there are so many opportunities for violence. That, I mean, what he was doing was an, was an instigation yeah. of violent acts. And what needs to stick out in our imagination isn't the fact that he you know, said to, to bring a couple swords with him. What needs mm-hmm. to stick out in our imagination is what you just said, that there's no violent acts. Yeah. Like there's no use of yeah. anything, and 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 even when there is violence with Peter, mm-hmm. Jesus rebukes it. Yeah. You know, so I mean that's the story. Yeah, that's the story. That's yeah. at least how the Christians understood it for centuries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Until maybe they just got fatigued of getting their butts kicked, and it and it got uh, they got tired of that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, we love power, and and the truth of the matter, the reason it's so hard to talk about this third way. Mm-hmm. Of, of being a peacemaker mm-hmm. is because whenever we're in a position where we actually can be a winner yeah. and we can beat the yeah. opponent, yeah. who among us can withstand that, can, yeah. can walk away from that? I mean, yeah. I, it's, this is easy for me to talk about because there's not much in my life where I can be the winner. <laughs> you know? yeah. I've been forced into yeah. a pretty humble situation, but... If I was, yeah. if I had money and power and, and great resources and uh-huh. authority, mm-hmm. who knows what I would do? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, so, that's part of the just the you've been walking a path of discipleship for a lot of years now. Yeah. And so some of that is you walk yourself into places where you lay down power. You do walk yourself into those places, but I think what happened with the early church after three hundred years is they walked into power, mm-hmm. and they had a choice finally that they never had before. Yeah. They they could be powerful, and yeah. that's so tempting. Sure, you know? we're still reeling oh, yeah. from that. Yeah, yeah, makes sense, but it makes it a difficult conversation for us today because we, uh, I think, are blind to how deeply. Uh, we are shaped by a culture that says it's good to win. It's how you began all this mm. conversation. Yeah. It's good to be the one having the gun instead of the one, yeah. on, you know, defenseless. Um, I mean, I grew up watching Westerns with my grandpa. I still love Westerns. I Sometimes now I'm like, ah, I don't know how all this sorts out with Jesus. And <laughs> what would Jesus say to <laughs> yeah. that cowboy? Right. Um, uh, which is becoming more important to me as I get older. <laughs> I want to get that on a T-shirt. Uh, what would Jesus say well, to I that mean, cowboy? Well, I mean, I think that a lot about just our, our all of our politics. Like mm-hmm. sometimes people say things and or these days post things on social media, and I'm just like, man, do you really with like if you would sit down at a table like this with Jesus, are you prepared to defend the position that you're taking? Mm. Um, I, I I don't know. I'm just in a place where I'm ready to be challenged on more of yeah. that. And I think when it comes to things like violence and keeping peace through violence, it is so um, baked into our imaginations culturally yeah. that to challenge that feels like we're challenging America or, it does. or, or challenging 
my grandpa who I love. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, because it's just so part of who we are. It does, and I think, but, but I think it needs to be reiterated that this third way is not about just laying down. Because sometimes when we think of the cross, we think of yeah. just laying down. Okay. But the cross is also this amazing statement in the face of mm. evil that says, I reject That's good. evil. And so we're not rejecting violence and saying we should run away or be passive. Being right? amazingly present, it's kind of a yeah. stepping, to be a peacemaker, you have to be in the conflict. Mm. You have to be in the fray. You can't run from it. Mm. You can't just be standing on the sideline. You've got to be right in it, which was one of the reasons that all of the protests now and the um, and the civil action that we're taking are good things that we that the church needs to be a part of, mm -hmm. because that's our way of being present and saying no, evil yeah. will not stand. Yeah. Um, so if you're a nine on the enneagram, this is not your free ticket to go. <laughs> yeah, I always knew that I was right. You know, <laughs> that's not the case because nines are characterized by avoiding conflict, yeah. and this is not about avoiding yeah. conflict. I would yeah. say. Probably the eights and the ones on either side of them have a foot ahead of them in, yeah. in, in peacemaking because they're stepping into things. Yeah, you know what I mean. Although I've got a yeah. I've got a good friend who's a nine and he's he's such a hero these days because he's so engaged. He's he's a mature guy and has been on this Jesus journey a long time, and he's realizing that that gift of detachment that that he has mm -hmm. uh, is allowing him to enter into things sure. that that stress me out. Quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. To be clear, you can be a redeemed nine yeah. and be amazingly powerful as a peacemaker. Yeah. Maybe so, it's um, the best kind of peacemaker. It's probably the best kind. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's good to, to understand. Yeah. So it's not uh, the the cure for the, the act of vi the, the violent route is not withdrawal. It's not going quiet, mm -hmm. um, but it's staying present, but staying present with a different kind of mode, which I think then you have to go to Jesus to say, how did he do that? Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's ever easy. I think you're, you're right. There's some wisdom that we're lacking and um, we have to stay present to Jesus and the, and the leading of the spirit to know even what that looks like, knowing that we're going to get things wrong. Yeah. Well, I think that, yeah, it involves love, compassion, mm -hmm. humility, and maybe that willingness to suffer. That's the hardest yeah. thing for us, is that willingness to suffer. Yeah. And, you know, but humility and compassion, I don't know, Rustin, I, I thought about maybe wrapping up with this story okay. of a friend of mine who's a pastor, and he has a really good story about implementing compassion and love and humility in ways that make peace yeah. that um, I was inspired by. Okay. If I'd love to hear it because okay. I, I think this is one of the keys is... I, I know for me, I want my imagination transformed by the stories that I, I hear so mm -hmm. that I have other options available to me uh, other than might makes right and I'm going to get my way, yeah. uh, even if I have to be violent. And I don't also want to just avoid or withdraw or say, I can't take this, so I'm just going to move away to the mountains. And Yeah. <laughs> so... Give me a give me the story of a third way. By the way, Rustin, yeah. which one of those two options is most tempting to you? Oh, I'm a, I'm a get out of here person. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> me too. That's yeah. what I have to always have to yeah, check in I think myself. That's just the way I'm wired. I'm yeah. a four on the enneagram, empathetic, mm -hmm. feel everybody else's feelings, and and so these kinds of times of tension and disagreement are are not easy for me. Yeah. 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 Me too. Well. Take this for what you will. Hopefully this will provide some help and spark the imagination. But I have a friend who's, and you know him too, but he's a pastor of an evangelical church. He's a lifelong evangelical. Hmm. But the reason I talk about him is because he started a friendship with a Jewish man, mm -hmm. a deep friendship with this Jewish artist who was born in Israel. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself hardly ever happens in our world. Yeah. Um, but not only that, the two of them started a friendship with a Muslim man who was born in Egypt. His name was Ahmed, and he was born in Egypt. And the three mm -hmm. of them have this friendship, but it's not just a, hi, how are you friendship? They're trying to do things. They're trying to bring peace to the yeah. world. So a Muslim, a Jew, and a Christian. I mean, it sounds like... It sounds like a joke. Well, and it partly, it sounds like a joke because it never happens. It never happens. Yeah. And the thing is, what I find most astonishing about their story is that it, the, what I'm about to tell did not involve any of them compromising their faith. Mm -hmm. so, so evangelicals typically want to hear this story play out, like the, the, the Muslim become, became a Christian. And, 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 but that's not the story. Yeah. The story instead is that these three men love each other mm -hmm. and that these three men have started amazing ministries together. One of the ones that I read about is when they're collecting um, toys. And they've collected thousands of toys for distribution among the poor children um, mm -hmm. in, uh, around Gaza. 
uh, the children who have been affected, affected by violence and war and poverty, the children of Israel and the children of Palestine, and, and, and the whole area around Gaza, and they have distributed all these toys because they've put their, their stuff together. Now, my friend says that when they first started to get together and talk about the uh, proactive things that they could do to make peace, mm -hmm. that they met the first time in the U.S. at his church. Mm -hmm. And when his Muslim friend, Ahmed, heard that they were meeting at his church and that it was an evangelical church, he was hesitant to come. And he said, those are the kind of people who hate me. And <sighs> what, a, what a terrible thing uh, for yeah. somebody to think about the church yeah you know but that's where not being peacemakers has gotten us yeah yeah well and i think when we hopefully we'll recap all these in one of our conversations but the other thing that's brewing in me is as we go through these beatitudes i just have this longing for the church to be known mm -hmm. by these things that these yeah. would be our characteristics and so well, as peacemakers, this is... You think of the meme that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if Ahmed goes online and he sees Christians posting He's pictures gonna, yeah. of people with yeah. shotguns and yeah. AK-47s yeah. using scripture to back yeah. that up, he's... You would be afraid he, to go to that church, too. He's right to assume that there are Christians in America who think that Jesus sanctions their violence against yeah. people who are different. Yeah. So they, the three of them wrote up a statement together, oh. and this will be our closing blessing, too. Okay. And hopefully, again, like you said earlier, I hope I don't make people mad. This could make people mad, but sometimes we have to make people <laughs> mad because you we're know, peacemakers. And you can't make peace without making some yeah, people I, mad. I suppose so. You suppose so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they call this for the common good. It's a statement that the three of them drafted. And here's what it says. We are Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and we are friends. That enough is mind-blowing. Shocking. We seek to follow our respective religious religions faithfully. We do not believe all religions are the same. We recognize the reality of our religious differences, but we are friends. We are devout in our faith and respectful of our friendship. Our faith and friendship need not be mutually exclusive. We recognize that we share common space. That might be a great way for the third way, too, is to see what we have mm -hmm. in common rather than what we have different, mm -hmm. right? The common space of a shared planet. Mm -hmm. For the sake of the common good, we seek common ground. We do not share a common faith, but we share a common humanity. In our different religions, we do not practice the same rituals or pray the same prayers. But in our shared humanity, we hold to a common dream. Shalom. Salam, peace. We hold to the dream that our children may play in peace without fear of violence. And so we pledge not to hate. We pledge not to dehumanize others. We pledge to do no harm in the name of God. As individuals, we do not compromise the truth claims of our respective religions, but we will not use truth claims to fuel hate or justify violence. Mm -hmm. We will practice our respective faiths, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, but we practice our faith, but we believe our faith can be practiced in the way of peace. We believe our faith truly practiced need never be at odds with humanitarian ideals. Mm -hmm. Our religions share a complex and intertwined history, a history of interaction that has too often been tumultuous and bloody. We believe there must be a better way and we seek that better way, the way of peace. We are Jews, Christians and Muslims, and we are friends. We seek common ground for the common good. Shalom, salam, peace. Amen. Amen. Please join me this morning in our corporate prayer of confession. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we lower our heads before you and we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on our lives as if there was no God and we fall short of being a credible witness to you. For these things we ask your forgiveness and we also ask for your strength. Give us clear minds and open hearts so we may witness to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us to be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. Hold us to you 
and build our relationship with you and with those you have given us on earth. Please take a moment and make your own prayers of confession known to God, as well as your prayers of gratitude in your requests. Almighty God, who does freely pardon all who repent and turn to him, now fulfill in every contrite heart the promise of redeeming grace, forgiving all of our sins, and cleansing us from an evil conscience through the perfect sacrifice of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In Matthew 26, we read, While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you the truth, I will not drink from this vine with you again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. I encourage you while you're at home, to take your elements, take your bread, and break off a piece. This is the body of Christ that is broken for you. And go ahead and dip it in your juice or your wine. This is the blood of Jesus that has been shed for you. Peace be with you.
thanks for joining us this morning. I want to send you with these words. Go with a blessing. As you have been fed at this table, go and feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go and set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing that you have received from the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be always with you. Amen.